Welcome to Life in the Law on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the Supreme Court. And we're going to ask, is the Supreme Court going off a cliff? Are we any closer to reform? Our guest for this show is Avi Seufer, a constitutional scholar who was dean for many years at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Welcome, Avi. Thank you, Jay. Good to be back. You're a constitutional scholar. You studied constitutional law, you taught constitutional law, you wrote constitutional law or about it, and, and you came on Think Tech a number of times to talk about constitutional law. But, you know, these days, what's the point? Is there still a point? Because there's nothing much you can do about, you know, their decisions. They're, you know, even to criticize them seems so futile. Uh, what are your thoughts about being a constitutional scholar? Is it still worthwhile? Well, it's worthwhile because it's so interesting, and I think it's worthwhile for purposes of understanding context and how awful this court is. Uh, I think it's crucial that our students and really all citizens understand that if we've gone off a cliff, and the court I think has in large measure, we shouldn't be lemmings and just follow them over the cliff. So we have to uh, establish some criteria, some guardrails, I guess is the current cliche, even though they don't care. And I guess that's now kind of circulating these days that maybe serious Supreme Court reform is called for. And I'd be happy to talk about what uh, some of those proposals are and give you my views on them. But first, I think maybe you wanted to talk about uh, how dreadful this court has been. And it really, you know, you try to say, well, we have inside baseball rules. Uh, precedents matter. Uh, it ought to be that the court has a theory or two about what they're doing other than this is what we want. This is what we like to do. We are a 6-3 majority. And they seem unwilling and unable to compromise even with the three. So it's 6-3 pretty consistently. Now, this, maybe this is a little glimmer of uh, silver lining. And that is that this court has had more separate concurrences than any other Supreme Court since 1937, I think, is when they began counting which means everybody's talking about it's the Roberts court. But Roberts, who assigns the major cases to himself because he's in the majority, uh, has actually had a fractured court. And you get a lot of justices usually agreeing with him in the result, but saying, but wait a minute, you've gone too far in that majority opinion, or here's a whole other theory. And so all these concurrences are not binding, but they are possibly developments for the future, both within the court and Justice Barrett is the prime example, who for the first time consistently is inconsistent with the majority. So not to say different results, but different approaches and more caution than Roberts and his colleagues have been showing. And Roberts and his colleagues, I think, and particularly Roberts, uh, are kind of slick about all this. It's kind of putting one over. And the, the uh, disastrous opinion, the pre presidential immunity decision, uh, they don't even have a pretense of any of the usual things they say they rely on. They say they rely on history and precedent. Well, what's the history of the view of the founders, for example, originalism, about a president above the law? They didn't like kings. There was a revolution, largely because of the king. They tried to be sort of tolerant of, of parliament, and so the Declaration of Independence aims at the king. And they believe and they believed they had rights even that weren't written down, the rights of Englishmen, and in those days it was only men, uh, that really counted. And so when they say, we don't care about precedent, we just don't like that one, which is basically what they did in the abortion decision, but they've been doing it a lot since. And the other thing that people may not notice is they're just out of control in the vehemence of their opposition to agencies, to federal agencies, to what they would call the administrative state. Well, it's not an administrative state. It is what we've lived with since FDR, really. And they're trying to undo the New Deal, frankly, and the role of agencies to be the experts and sometimes to advance policies that not, not all the country wants. And if you think about civil rights, for example, if they left it to counting noses of the states, we'd never have civil rights statutes and the expansion of civil rights. So the agencies were key in saying, we ought to have some justice and equity here, not just what Congress is or isn't able to pass. I wanted to share a thought I had with you. It goes back to antitrust. It goes back to the notion of 
price fixing can, and conspiracies. You know, it seems to me that although there are exceptions in certain cases, which maybe are not so important, uh, usually you can predict what they're going to do, and it's ideological. I, that's a way of, you know, forgiving them in part for their decisions, to call it motivated by ideological. I, I don't really ascribe to that. But they're always in the same place. And it reminds me of antitrust. It reminds me of a, of a conspiracy because they get together, you know what they're gonna do, they always do the same thing, um, and it's just filthy. Uh, your thoughts? Well, antitrust uh, enforcement, of course, is a malleable thing. A lot depends on the administration. And I guess that's one of the complaints about the agencies. But the agencies have their own autonomy to some extent, largely because Congress can't take up the specifics of uh, a bump stock uh, and whether that turns a gun into a machine gun or not. And the Congress, of course, is, is largely gridlocked anyway. So when they say, oh, you should send this back to Congress, this is a major question that Congress has to answer. So they won't. And what the court is doing is seizing power, therefore, and doing whatever it wants to do. And two other manipulations, if you will. They say they rely on text. There is no text, period, exclamation point, quotes, non-quotes, there is no text that supports their view of the president of the United States. There was very little in the Constitution about the president. And the so-called executive powers are derived from three little passages. Vested, the powers are vested in the president. And there's a whole list of the things the president often can't do alone, appointing uh, the ambassadors, for example, and other uh, executive uh, officers. Um, there's commander-in-chief. Well, yeah, OK, but are these commander-in-chief issues, whether the president has committed a crime? Not quite. Sometimes, yes. And there's the uh, kind of uh, unfair deal of what the court has done about the role of the president and the agencies when it comes to we're going to say, oh, that is an emergency, or that is an emergency. And what they just did is to say, not only is there absolute immunity for anything anyone basically can call official, but there's also immunity at the perimeter. And making it even worse, if it's not official, and it's not hard for a president to say, I ordered that killing because I thought it was a terrorist. Not a crime. Impeachable if you find out about it, but you don't find out about it, right? Um, so there's no text except commander in chief vested and to see that the laws are faithfully executed. Ironically, that's the third source of executive authority in the constitution. So no source in the text and no source in terms of precedent. When during the Korean conflict project uh, police action or whatever you want to call it, uh, Harry Truman thought that the steel mills were essential for bullets and guns and tried to seize the steel mills. And that sounds more radical than it was. He was leaving everyone in place. And the reason in part that he lost, because the Supreme Court said, you can't do that, by the way, President, uh, was because there were some statutes that he probably could have invoked, which at least would have slowed down the, the threatened strike. So he lost for various reasons, and the court was split all over the place. But people cared, right? The executive can't just do it. And Nixon, of course, argued that there was executive authority to withhold what they were after, which turned out to be fatal for his presidency. And the court said no. And they even said criminal law takes precedence. So here we're saying, no, oh, criminal law doesn't matter. And precedence about what presidents have and haven't done, that doesn't matter. Uh, we're just going to say absolute immunity based on nothing. It's shocking. It really is shocking. And that gets us to what possible reforms there might be. Now, there are shocking small examples as well as that big example. And the final thing I think that I want to emphasize is the manipulation of time. And we've seen that by this court repeatedly. So at the beginning of the term, Colorado thought that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment meant that someone who had been involved in an insurrection, as they believe Trump had been, uh, who was could have testified but didn't, uh, to say, no, I didn't, or whatever. So Colorado decided that, therefore, because the text of the Constitution says, not on the ballot, not holding official uh, jobs. So in their primary, they tried to exclude, or at least they had decided to exclude, uh, Trump. The court didn't worry about the text 
or the history precedent and context of where that came from. Although obviously right after the Civil War, they knew something about insurrection and the problem and a lot of lives, a lot of blood uh, spilled over that issue in the Civil War. So that's what they were trying to address. So you could argue, well, it's a misconception of what insurrection means. That isn't what the court did. They came up with a whole new theory. And they did it in fewer than two, three weeks, I guess. It was 22 days or something like that. So they went from beginning that argument to three weeks, let's say, of deciding unanimously, by the way. Then we have the Trump in the criminal context question. And they've had 60 cases of various judges saying president like Trump had to disclose tax returns, whatever. There are a lot of decisions that limited the power of that president as it happens. But as I said, there are others, lots of limits on presidential power. That case was decided by the Court of Appeals and sat there for months and finally was put down for final argument after all the other oral arguments had been settled. I think it was April 25th and just decided July 1st. What was needed? There was emergency in other situations where they grab an abortion case, for example, well, that's an emergency. But this has a, you know, well, time will pass and we'll just decide when we want to decide. And clearly when decisions come down at the end of the term, there were internal disagreements. Uh, and the brilliant, I think, truly brilliant dissent by Sotomayor says, not alone, uh, it was 6-3, uh, but she says that usually, she doesn't say it in so many words, you end a dissent by saying, I respectfully dissent. She doesn't do that. And she worries about the concepts of freedom in our society. If you uh, talk about um, their manipulation of time, you should also mention, this is something we've talked about before, the shadow docket and, and how that is a, a further corruption of what we expect from them. So the shadow docket, in a, in a sense, is necessary. There's no denying that any court needs to kind of keep track of whether a case is still live, whether it's been uh, decided already and so on. So they have to do that. And they have a very complicated docket because they have thousands, literally thousands of cases uh, where people are seeking their review. They're appealing the petition for writ of certiorari in almost all those cases. They're saying, please, court, take up this decision. Often they show that there's the conflict between two of the courts of appeals. Two circuits have disagreed. And so they say to the court, please sort this out for us. The court doesn't always do that. They manipulate the docket, you could say. But this court has, if there's something they disagree with, they'll issue a stay and skip the court of appeals. And then they'll decide sometimes without oral argument, without briefs on some of the essential questions. They just, in the Idaho case, the abortion case, this term, first there was an emergency. And the emergency was that, the, that Idaho couldn't ban abortion as they wanted to. So the court stopped everything. They issued a stay. And then at the end, they said, oh, well, it was the technical term is improvidently granted. We shouldn't have taken this case up in the first place. There's some glimmer of light in that, in that people are speculating that Justice Barrett was unwilling to go along with those who had voted to take the case in the first place. But it shows that at the time of the pandemic, they were saying it was an emergency that people weren't allowed to worship together. It was some reason to think that doctors were right, that germs might carry more if they were religiously together as a congregation, as opposed to praying on their own or 10 or whatever it is. And very glibly, the court said, well, there are no regulations like that on buying liquor. So, you know, prayer, liquor, which one wins? Well, they said, prayer, that's an emergency. And they really personally, some of them attacked Chief Justice Roberts, actually. Um, that was a case that was set down for argument in 10 days. And instead of letting the Court of Appeals decide, they grabbed it. This is all disheartening, actually. And um, you know, I see it maybe in simplistic terms where they're, they're following their quote, and I'm being charitable, ideology here. But what is really happening is that they're following politics. They have been, in the significant cases, politicized to the nth degree. The founders never expected that. The founders were hoping that giving them life terms would allow them to rise above politics but they have lowered themselves into politics in every which way. And of course, 
that goes to the ethics as well. Uh, your thoughts about you know, whether they are thinking correctly in terms of following the I ideology, the politics, or the, or the needs, the, the morality uh, of the nation, the needs of the people. They seem to be a complete disconnection. Uh, this is not what the founders intended. Well, that's a little trickier than it first seems, I think, because judicial review, which is what we've been talking about, constitutional review of something, and then saying it's unconstitutional, uh, wasn't actually in the text of the Constitution. Some of the colonies had had that, but not as a sort of majority view. That's what courts always do. So it was a real innovation. It's an innovation that was really led by uh, Chief Justice John Marshall. And uh, he was brilliant in the way he set it up in Marbury versus Madison in 1803. And that's been established. So the people who are kind of wise acres about, oh, you know, it's got to be in the text. It's not in the text. Judicial review, as we know it, is not in the text. Now, the framers were concerned particularly about executive authority, but they also were concerned about Congress and about the way in which it was the very beginning of opposing parties. They didn't plan for partisan politics, but they knew it was kind of bubbling up. They also had the slavery issue. They had sectional rivalries and so on. So we have a decision maker. And famously, Andrew Hamilton in the Federalist Papers talked about the judiciary as the least dangerous branch. Because they don't have money and they don't have force. They don't have armies and navies, right? So it's the least dangerous branch. And a lot of justices have taken that seriously. And they're not always liberal or conservative justices. So you can talk about Frankfurter and Brandeis as kind of on opposite sides in many things, but they both agreed on what uh, Alex Bickle called, who was a Frankfurter clerk, called passive virtues, that the court shouldn't always intervene. We're final only because we're final, it's not because we're right. It's a Brandeis, a, a paraphrase of a Brandeis point. So don't take every case, don't get involved, but look at what this court is doing. They are just aggressively taking cases. And I, I got to say, and this is a, a, a bit of a, a side note, I guess, or a footnote, but four of the current justices were involved in what was called the Brooks Brothers Rebellion, which is Gore, Bush versus Gore. And they were involved in the riot, I guess is what it's called most commonly, by people who were in Brooks Brothers ties and dresses, whatever you get at Brooks Brothers, right? Fancy shoes. They were in Florida, they were involved in delay. They played for time. And Justice Scalia, in particular, helped them do that. And then at the end of the day, when the Supreme Court decided who the president would be, they said, oh, sorry, we're out of time. We can't do another count, a fairer count, if there's a problem with this way of counting votes. We're out of time. There's nothing in the Constitution that said they were out of time. They just said that. So time was manipulated, and it gave us the president that we got. So there have been instances of the court intervening. That one at least bubbled up. This one, the presidential immunity doctrine, it's out of whole cloth. It's out of the head of the chief justice and his colleagues. It, there's nothing in support of it. And so people, even people who are more or less moderate uh, commentators on the Constitution, they said, there is no Constitution. I mean, if you could do that, there are no guardrails in the Constitution or in the doctrines and the precedents that the court has developed over several hundred years. So that's pretty shocking. That failure, failure to, to comply with precedent, the failure to think of the people, the country, the interests of the nation, uh, the complete politicization on top of the corruption, the gifts, the obvious transactional um, nature of all of this, but at least two of them uh, and, and their wives um, are, is really shocking. I don't know how the other members of the court feel, but I tell you, if I was on the court and I saw that happening, I would make public statements about it. But we don't see that, do we? Um, so, you know, yeah, you can talk about it in a dissent. That's nice. Um, but they don't talk about it enough. They should get out there with op-eds and essay pieces and criticize their brethren. I don't know why they don't do that. We should do that. But anyway, let me go back. Well, let, me, let me just... So what we, what, we, what we have, I'm coming to my question here, what we have is a, is a serious crisis of confidence about these individuals, these justices, and this institution. And my question to you, and this is not easy, 
What effect? We know that it has a, a terrible effect on the, Christ, the, the level of confidence of the public in the court. That's clear. That's, that's, that's in a poll, many polls. But what about the other members of the judiciary? What about the courts of appeals and the federal district courts? What about the state courts? They must, they must see this happening. What effect does it have on their decision process? So two points in direct answer, and then I want to go to the public perception and what could be done about it uh, for a minute or two. Uh, so one of them is that our court, our high court, our Hawaii Supreme Court has been sounding off in ways that no other court at that level, at least in the country, is doing. Uh, and they've done it in the context of gun rights in particular, uh, and Ju Justice uh, Todd Eddins uh, led the court, but the court was with him. Um, so it wasn't just Todd Eddins, it was our Supreme Court on gun rights said, we got a history of regulating, going back to monarchy times, specific history. And the court has gone off in their view, the deep, the deep end. And while we're not saying we're not bound by it, we don't have to take that approach. Here's what we think, and here's why we think the court is wrong. It's a very gutsy and unusual move. And it is the talk of a lot of, uh, at, at least uh, faculty lounges, I guess, but I think also of judiciaries. And it is, there's a federal judge, uh, Judge Tattel, I think is how it's pronounced, the blind judge, who terrific DC judge. Uh, and he retired, he wrote a book, but he retired because he said, this is a court, this is a time when all the things I believed all my life are no longer true, so I can't still be a judge. That's a pretty interesting and important thing. You don't have that. Sometimes federal judges leave to make a lot of money or something like that. They run, some of the justices were running for president, which was not necessarily good uh, at various times. But this is a judge sort of calling them out in ways that judges or even retired judges don't usually do. Now, what is to be done? Quoting a famous source who was not an American legal type, uh, what is to be done? So Senator Whitestone of Rhode Island has an ethics bill, which is interesting. He says there's always the problem of the review within the collegial court, or we hope collegial court. Uh, and so what we ought to do is have a special federal panel of federal court of appeals judges chosen at random and let them be the ones to judge whether Clarence Thomas shouldn't be taking these trips. And even if he took them, he should be reporting them. And what about his spouse and so on? Maybe he should, on occasion, decide that he shouldn't decide, that he should recuse himself is the, the legal uh, term. But he, he doesn't know. He doesn't care. And, you know, look the other way. Um, so I think that's an intriguing proposal, because there is the practical problem, and there's a practical solution. Um, well, let, me, let me offer you a thought. If they really meant it, these judges and you know the courts of appeals or what have you, whatever organization could step up on this, Avi, they could just do it. They could meet, they could evaluate, um, they could do what courts of appeals judges do, and, uh, and then they could publish, use the media. I don't think they need the imprimatur of the Supreme Court to do it, and I don't think they need the imprimatur of Congress to do it. Just do it. What do you think? Who would do it? I didn't follow where you were leading. It's, a group of Court of Appeals judges. Oh, they could just do it, although, you know, there'd be arguments about um, seizing jurisdiction that they don't have, but it's it's better, it's cleaner if Congress were to do it. And the hope is there will be a uh, more popular concern like what we're discussing and that there will be a, a move towards that, because you're absolutely right. It's It's shocking, the low esteem of this court. It really is. And we came, both of us came through law school and at a time when we were questioning a lot of what the court was doing, but nothing like now. And that's true. You can show in the poll results, but you can show in conversations or uh, even the fact that there are these serious proposals to change the court. Now, everyone, the usual arguments are, oh, you need a constitutional amendment for that, one. And the second argument is to say, uh, well, if you did that, then in the next election, the other party would do the other. And so we would you know, pack the court in a way that is unmanageable. So on the first, well, let me take the, the second one first. We have had a different number of justices in our history. Now, there are a lot of changes until uh, 1869. And one of the things to know about 1869 is that that was a, that was a time 
when the court had changed its membership and the numbers, and they weren't always une uneven, right? So sometimes there could have been a tie, and sometimes still, because justices are sick or, or recuse themselves or whatever, there still are ties. So it's not unthinkable you have a tie. But let's say it has to be an odd number of justices. From 1864, I think it was, until 1869, we had a 10th justice. It was Justice Field. Justice Field had thereafter the longest term on the Supreme Court of any justice till William O. Douglas broke that record. And he was famous or notorious for various reasons. But we didn't have a 10th justice after that. And indeed, someone had been named to be the 10th justice because there was an opening on the court. And then they decided, oh, no, we don't want a 10th justice anymore, possibly because it could be evenly divided. But it wasn't an era of good feeling. 1860s, right? There was a civil war going on. There was then reconstruction and so on. So it wasn't that everybody agreed. It was not uh, all because this is all mellow. In some ways, it's the opposite. And the irony is the person who had been named didn't make a lot of noise, didn't try to litigate, because he got to be attorney general of the United States. And that was regarded as much more important than the Supreme Court of the United States at that time. So you could change the number. And one would hope that it wouldn't be tit for tat thereafter. You could set a maximum. Right. There are a lot of things you could do. And that doesn't require a constitutional amendment because the Constitution says nothing about the specific number of the justices. OK. Um, the other thing that you could do, because they have lifetime tenure, and their big proposals these days seem to be about uh, changing that 18-year term limit. Like That's that. Joe Biden's proposal just a day right. or two ago. And Maisie Hirono is one of the sponsors of that in the Senate going back sometime now. So it's it's not new altogether. A very clever way to try to do it, and that is to say every president gets to appoint two justices. Assuming we have nine justices, which I've just said is not written in the Constitution, at least, uh, then if you had nine, and then you have every two years, you get to 18. So it's the same number. And that's the proposal, 18 years. And uh, Justice Breyer said, oh, I wish we had that so people stop bothering me about whether I retire now or I retire later, then I have an answer, you know, 18 years, and, and then I'm on the court. Uh, so that's clever. Uh, it, arguably, um, you can't do that for a variety of practical reasons, or at least I'm, I'm making the argument. One of them is the power of the, of the Chief Justice is crucial in time that we talked about is crucial. And if you think about this constant turnover, then you would worry about kicking the can down the road or grabbing a case early so that you can try to set a precedent if everyone knows that there are going to be two new justices in the next four years. That's a problem. Uh, the, the other problem, I think, with it is, and this is Justice Sotomayor, who was here, has been here a couple of times here in Hawaii, uh, she talked about how she loved being a Supreme Court justice until recently. She had a very different view when she was last here this past year, uh, about how she had loved the job until recently when you can't talk to some of the other justices. You can't really have a, a good conversation. That's pretty shocking for her to say. And in a, in a public interview that Martha Minow uh, conducted at Harvard, she said, oh, yeah, there are those days when I go back to my chambers and I close the door and I cry. Now, coming from Sotomayor, who is tough, that's quite a revelation, I think. But this goes back to a, a, a milder argument, I guess. She said that even though she was a very distinguished federal district court judge and court of appeals judge for a long time on a very busy and important court, the Second Circuit, she said it took her four or five years to sort of adjust to the role of being on the Supreme Court. So I think it does take time to kind of learn about your new powers and maybe about the restraint that you ought to show uh, rather than a court of appeals where you always can say, well, if I got it wrong, someone above can correct it. Uh, so it's a different mindset. And I don't know if that would work with our 18-year uh, proposal. But one of the proposals that might be a proposal that doesn't need much attention, either from Congress or the constitutional change, is to say, well, there's still justices for life. They're just not on the high court. And we have had Supreme Court justices uh, retire and then serve as Court of Appeals judges, sitting by designation, it's called. So you wouldn't take away their lifetime appointment. Some of them might retire or resign, uh, but there's there's an interesting possibility. And there, again, is no 
specific language that says, and you are on the high court and you get to do judicial review of the sort we've been talking about. You know, I, I, um, I think there were three parts to Biden's uh, proposal. I'm not sure that it's entirely consistent with uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehead out of Rhode Island, um, but uh, it, it has a certain measure of gravitas because it's Joe Biden. Um, on the other hand, he's got 90 days to go and query what can he do in that period? What can he do with this Congress? What, what can Kamala Harris do with this Congress? You have to have cooperation. So the first point is reversing the uh, Trump versus United States uh, immunity case. And um, it seems like you could do that in Congress if you could get a vote in Congress. Uh, yeah, the cleaner way to do it would be to have a new constitutional amendment. And there's language yep. posed and it looks like embraced by Biden. So that would be if you could do it. Now, there's no way this Congress or the next Congress probably is going to pass a constitutional amendment. And we don't want a new constitutional convention, I would think. And there's another way you can get amendments proposed, but that's never been invoked. And it takes even, it's even harder politically uh, to get the states to line up, as it were, which you would require. Um, so I think that and many of us who teach constitutional law uh, have sort of signed things saying, yeah, this is good language. It ought to be adopted. But it takes a while, right? Even if it emerged from Congress, uh, then the states have to ratify it. You have to get a, a super majority of states to ratify it. And that's not about to happen uh, on such a thing, I think. Uh, although the bottom line answer to what you said is vote, vote, vote. Tell your friends in places other than Hawaii, which seems pretty clear as to what the results will be. The down ballot counts hugely as to who's in the Senate, for example. And uh, this may come out better than it looked like it would in those terms, but this is a crucial existential overuse, but it's, it's a consequential election. If he wins or takes power through another insurrection or another you know, sleight of hand uh, with the states and um, phony electoral ballots and all that, um, we're in deep kimchi. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we have to be as practical as possible. And um, I, don't, I don't think the states are going to do it because they're largely Republican. And you're right, it's going to take forever. And we don't have that much, we, the country, the future of the country, we don't have that much time. So um, the practical solution is um, if you can get Congress to pass it, pass it. Um, and that means, as you said, vote, vote everywhere. Vote in every state, vote for every congressional representative and every senator. The other thing is, um, you know, you mentioned that um, it, it, it's, it's questionable as to whether term limits requires a constitutional amendment or not. But, you know, one thing I thought about when you were exposing on that was, well, suppose there's a big issue, call it a constitutional issue as to whether Congress has the power to do term limits and uh, and, and, and shifts in, in, in power and practical organization of the court. And the argument would be from the Republicans, from Trump, from the MAGA, the GOP, that no, it doesn't. Okay, so that's a legal question. It's a constitutional question. Where does that go? It goes to the Supreme Court. So query, what do you think the Supreme Court would do? <laughs> you know the answer. Well, we have, a, there's actually a term limits decision which came out sort of surprisingly when states were trying to say we have term limits. And actually, in practical terms, that probably would hurt the states if they're trying to elect federal officials, Congress in other words, uh, with term limits because they would never get seniority. And seniority is very important in the Congress of the United States. But the court on that one said states you can't impose term limits. But that's not a, a clear precedent for what you're positing. But what this court would come out and say, I think we both know the answer to that, because they're very much ends rather than means driven. They're not interested in process. Uh, they will just uh, shatter precedent when they want to. Sometimes they set it up and they show you, please give us a case like this so we can do something. And there are court of appeals judges now who are kind of writing their opinions uh, in order to get noticed. If, uh, the, the party they're in prevails, they want to fill any openings on the court. There are two justices in their 70s, uh, Thomas being the oldest, 
and Alito being the second, I think 76 and 72 or something. So what are the demographic odds? I'm not sure of replacements. And what happened with the New Deal, when the court had been giving FDR and the New Deal a very hard time, it was a whole bunch of resignations and deaths all at once. So first he didn't get to a point, then he got to a point, a lot of justices. Uh, so that's pretty hard to predict. Um, I do think that we should be aware of manipulation of time where it didn't get much publicity. So I've talked about the court doing it. Think about what Mitch McConnell did. Mitch McConnell said, oh, election coming up, not right away, but coming up in the next term, right, two years of Congress and the Senate. So before the next election, we shouldn't appoint anybody. And he just froze the attempt and it worked, right? Then we get the Trump administration and we have the possibility of an appointment. And election had already started in some states. The election was underway. Ballots were being cast by mail. And that didn't bother them. What's this two year rule? This is a few months rule. And that's how we got Justice Barrett. So there's no principle about time when it comes to politics, I guess. But we didn't have much shouting about either one in terms of outrage from people as they should be outraged. Another example. So they're voting on impeachment. And again, it's McConnell. And he says, well, I'm not going to vote for this. There's a lot to it, but I'm not going to vote for it because he'll be criminal. He'll be liable in regular criminal court, the sitting president, Trump. But then, of course, oh, no, he's not, it turns out. There's absolute immunity. Yeah, Bob, but McC McConnell is filthy. He's been filthy all along. He's largely responsible for this. His legacy is, is uh, elements that could destroy the country, that are destroying the country. So the, the third part of uh, Biden's uh, proposal is to do something about ethics on the court. And you and I talked about um, you know, getting courts of appeal judges to get together either with blessing or without blessing uh, and, and comment and, and create their view of what the proper ethics should be in the Supreme Court. I agree there's a, an issue as to the legitimacy of that if it's not blessed by Congress and it won't be blessed by Congress. But, you know, there is uh, the possibility, I think Joe Biden was alluding to it, of having Congress act and create a code of conduct. But the likelihood is right now that that will not pass. And uh, depending on the elections, uh, you know, the congressional elections in November, uh, it's not likely to pass under, under Harris. So are we stuck with that, Avi? Is that the way it's going to be? Uh, do we have to wait for the, the recomposition of the court somehow before we get mm, a court we can have ethical confidence over? Well, I can't predict, even you can't predict, Jay, but um, I think there is and ought to be public outrage. And I think public outrage sometimes influences the court, even if it isn't in the case. Um, and even very skilled politicians like FDR, like Teddy Roosevelt, uh, ran into trouble when they attacked the court. They lost. Court packing team didn't pass for, for FDR. Uh, so the problem, in a sense, is also the strength of the court. And that is, there is public reverence for the court and the need to have things decided. So Bush versus Gore, those of us teaching constitutional law at the time, thought it's going to be really hard to teach it with a straight face. Very quickly, people accepted what had happened. Um, and we went on, and constitutional law, if anything, became more important. There are inside baseball rules that I alluded to. This court is not following them. Now, that's hard to explain to the public. But we, I think, have seen the public change its general perception of institutions over time. And the hope is, I mean, one of the reasons, so Sotomayor was asked, uh, sort of, how do you keep going? You know, if, if it's so frustrating, uh, and the same question, I think, is posed to people who teach constitutional law, and they're not just in law schools, and sort of ought to be your question to the public, to all of us. What do you make of the, of the Supreme Court and what it's doing and how awful it seems if you listen to me and you, I guess? Uh, very few people do, but let's say they did. Well, she said, you just have to keep going. She said, you have no choice. You don't have an option. People died for these rights. People were beaten for these rights. So you have to keep trying. And then she said, I believe that the arc of justice does, or the arc does bend towards justice. But sometimes it takes a long time. And so why did justices write dissents? For the future. 
right? Not just for guidance for lower courts. And when Thomas, on his own, talks about special prosecutors, well, what happened? Judge Cannon decided that was a new constitutional rule, just one joke, one vote. On the other hand, we can point to dissents and First Amendment cases, for example, that won the battle of history, as the court has said. So we got to keep talking. We got to keep poking and election and voting all the way down the ballot. Because the role of states and who gets to be in Congress is often tied to who was in, the, in an office in the state. But also, as I was talking about our Supreme Court, we have judicial review. We have public comment if a justice is up because we have an age limit. If a justice is up and the Judicial Selection Commission is called upon, then these are comments that come to them. Not to say it should happen or that it does happen very often, but we have review of our judges and justices. And so, as you said, the federal judges, except for the Supreme Court, that exception should be exceptional and should appall people, given the current court. We're out of time, Avi, so we're going to have to leave it there. I hope we can continue this conversation because I know the problem is going to continue. Thank you so much, Avi. Mm -hmm.